All right. Well, hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the new Jacobin uh, series, Stay at Home. Uh, obviously, this is a very uh, difficult time. I hope everyone's doing well at home. Uh, everyone's, um, you know, safe. And um, obviously, our politics is based on meeting people, on kind of organizing them, on knocking on doors, on mass rallies, on strikes, on things that it's very hard to do uh, physically uh, distant. So we figured at Jacobin that we would spend uh, the next month uh, doing almost every day at, at 6 p.m. Uh, these uh, video lectures. So today uh, we're with um, uh, Mike Davis, who's the author of many books, um, including Planet of Slums, Slums uh, City of Courts. Uh, he's a frequent contributor to many different publications, including New Left Review, and he has a recent piece out in Jacobin that came out last week. Um, so I'll leave it to uh, Mike and he'll chat uh, for about 25, 30 minutes, and then we'll have some questions for you. So if you have any uh, questions that arise during Mike's talk, uh, put them in the YouTube uh, comments. The internet comments can actually be good for something. And um, then we'll we'll pick some of them and we'll, we'll throw them to, to Mike after he's done chatting. Should yeah, I begin? Go ahead, yeah. I have to begin with, um, it's sad and, and for me personally, pretty devastating news, which is Michael Sorkin died today of coronavirus in a New York hospital. He'd been in intensive care unit for most of the week. Michael Sorkin, by any measure, is undoubtedly the most important radical theorist of urban life and of architecture of the last 50 years. And those of us who are old enough to remember the village voice in the 1980s in its heyday, when he was architecture critic, will remember his, the war that he conducted with such brilliance against the super developers and urban race rapists like Donald Trump and the Whitman-esque prose with which he sang the ballad of his city's unruly democratic uh, streets. Michael, oh, you bastard. Why did you go? We need you more than ever right now. Michael Sorkin. Now, as we switch on the news today, we'll see the same scene over and over again, which is a medical team or a doctor forced to make a decision that no medical team or doctor should ever have to make in a wealthy country like this, which is a decision about triage. Who gets the ventilator? Who doesn't? What degree of risk? ICU personnel should be exposed to in desperate last minute efforts to save a dying patient. And it's occurring all across the country in our undersupplied, overwhelmed, overcrowded hospitals. But there's another triage in this epidemic, in this pandemic, um, which we don't talk about very often because we don't talk about the global poor. We don't talk about what happens when COVID hits the poor countries of the world, which is doing right now. And that triage is not only a matter of, of the current administration and other right-wing nationalist governments in the world. It's also something in which as progressives or socialists, we're complicit in too, because we haven't talked much about our sisters and brothers uh, who constitute the majority of humanity. Now, we have a kind of image of this pandemic as a kind of linear event. Uh, it starts to grow exponentially, it reaches the climax, then it declines, then perhaps we face one, maybe two further waves of infection, which we believe are probably gonna be milder uh, than the original infection. That's the kind of thing, the, the 
concept of the pandemic that exists on television we hear about all the time. That's not necessarily the case. Uh, the 1918-1919 Spanish flu, why is it called Spanish flu? Actually, the first cases were detected in Kansas. Maybe it should have been called the Kansas flu. Everybody in the world was calling, labeling whatever minority group they despised or, or enemy, uh, giving it a different, a different name to establish its alien credentials. But in fact, the Spanish flu first detected at Camp Fugston uh, in Kansas. We probably call it the Kansas flu. That flu emerged in the spring of 1918, in, in March, probably the first uh, uh, cases. And it was more virulent than uh, recent flus had been, killed quite a few people. And then it disappeared, only to come back with the vengeance in summer, by the way, in a warm season uh, in summer. Don't expect coronavirus to suddenly crawl under the rug because uh, it's 95 out, outside. And most of the historians who've written about the Spanish flu have focused on what happened then in the United States or on the Western Front where the Spanish flu played decisive role in defeating Germany because simply more Germans got sick and they didn't have reinforcements like the allies had, had the Americans. That's the story. And in fact, it was only the beginning of the real massacre, which was in India. 60% of the people who died on earth from the Spanish flu died in India. Why? Well, Indians were on the brink of famine and large, in, in some part due to a drought, but in large part due to the forced exports of grain to Britain, the requisition of grain by the Indian armies uh, in the field. Uh, there had been recent cholera. So when the Spanish flu arrived in Western India and encountered the immune suppressed bodies of malnourished people, it turned into just a devastating plague uh, with fantastic mortality. It killed somewhere between 20 and 22 million people. It also seems that in the course of its spread in India, it began to change character, it wasn't as discriminating as it had been before. The Spanish flu was, of course, uh, unusual than the highest mortality was among healthy young uh, adults. But when you're dealing with a mass of poor people with pre-existing conditions, with immunocompromised uh, uh, bodies, uh, such distinctions are put on the side. I think that is what we have to consider possible now, that the pandemic has reached Gaza, it's reached in the great slums of Africa, like Kibera and Nairobi. It's appeared in the poorest parts of India. Now in Sub-Saharan Africa, there's still 24 million people with HIV AIDS. There are millions more with tuberculosis. Four of the five worst health systems in the world are in West Africa, including the largest country in Africa, Nigeria, which despite its huge oil exports has failed to build even minimal uh, comprehensive uh, uh, healthcare. All these countries, by the way, of course, now plummeting into depression, in Nigeria's case, because of the loss of, of oil revenue. So you have it, a, um, a continent primed for disaster, and probably the same case in parts of India, where even in the most modern high-tech cities with their California-like suburbs for software engineers are surrounded by slums and shanties. Now, one thing that could happen as the pandemic burns through 
these areas is it could flip a switch in how the pandemic spreads and the kind of critical diseases that it produces. Right now, the pandemic is primarily a respiratory disease attacking uh, the lungs and causing viral pneumonia and maybe even helping promote bacterial pneumonia. But in a minority of the present cases, the virus has taken a different route, fecal oral transmission. It becomes a gastrointestinal infection. Now, why is that significant? Well, most of what was known about coronaviruses uh, was not from the study of common colds. It was from the study of animals, from veterinary science, because pigs especially uh, have suffered just devastating epidemics of uh, coronaviruses in recent years. And what was discovered in studying pigs was that there were these two modes, the gastrointestinal and enteric mode and the pulmonary or respiratory mode. The respiratory mode produced mortality, but much less than the gastrointestinal mode. This is far more lethal. And right now, there's four or five articles out there uh, circulating, discussing what might happen if in countries which have inadequate or totally no sanitation systems or populations don't have access to clean water. This spreads by the fecal oral route. Could it then metamorphosize and turn into an even more lethal pandemic than we have now? It's not known, but it's a real possibility. So the great slaughter of contemporary humanity by this disease has not yet occurred. Hopefully, uh, there will be a deus ex machina here and perhaps by some, you know, miracle, the uh, coronavirus will mutate into uh, uh, a milder form. But the opposite is even more likely. Now, who has this on, it, on his mind, on her mind, day in and day out. Who's responsible for the public health of the world? Well, naturally, the first thing you think of is it's the World Health Organization. But the World Health Organization is entirely powerless right now. Some years ago, because of SARS and, and the very scary experience with the emergence of um, avian flu, uh, a convention was created by the WHO, uh, a master plan on how countries cooperating with each other should react to the next pandemic. Everyone has ignored this, almost without exception, not even bothering to consult with the WHO. They've done all the things that weren't supposed to happen, hoarding uh, medicine and test kits, uh, not sharing vital information, shutting down all aircraft traffic when there should be a modicum of air traffic available so that health workers can go back and forth. Countries which advertised their great generosity a few years ago by how much they were gonna to donate to a pandemic fighting fund of the WHO have never paid up. Uh, their promise is about the same as Donald Trump's. Uh, in that regard. Plus, as anybody who's familiar with the WHO knows, it is a bit like an American regulatory agency. And American regulatory agencies historically have been controlled by the very ind industries they kind of regulate. So the WHO much depends on the charity of people like the Gates Foundation, it is dominated to uh, a very frightening degree by big pharma, 
I remember when I wrote a book on avian flu 15 years ago, I went to Geneva and I talked to the WHO and India had been crusading for the genetic production of these antivirals that had proven successful uh, with new flu strains. But the WHO ended up opposing generic production because Roach sat down with them and said, look, we'll give you, uh, you know, we'll give you a year's worth of the antiviral, but we don't want you to advocate generic production. They went along with this. The director general of the WHO a week or two ago came out and praised Donald Trump, said he was doing absolutely uh, the right thing. So the frontline international organization, which has issued report after report on the danger of pandemics, has basically folded up, both because of its own internal contradictions, but above all, because the rich countries in general have forsaken international cooperation and have violated the very convention that they signed uh, a few years ago. How about Europe? Europe prides itself on its fast response to famines and human emergencies in poor countries. Well, the question we ask right now is, is Europe dead? Is the European ideal now dead? Because look at Italy. What have its European sisters done except for close their borders, hoard their own supplies of, of, of masks and test kits? So that right now, the most substantial aid that Italy is getting is headed its way from Shanghai. The Chinese are intervening with, with a pipeline of medical supplies, medical advice. Uh, this raises a profound question. It's, it, it actually mirrors the European response to the refugee crisis, which was each country uh, for itself. But to get back to the original point, what have we done as a lot, as the, the opposition? Where in any of the primary debates did our champions, Bernie or Elizabeth, talk about global poverty? We need to ensure that we talk about it all the time. And in the present context, of the pandemic, we have to make universal coverage. The basis of our foreign policy as well. Immediately, we need to start educating people about the threat to the poor majority of this planet. And we should be demanding at this moment as the production of protective gear and uh, um, possibly, and test kits and possibly antivirals and eventually vaccine. We have to ensure that enough of it is produced and keeps being produced, that it can be supplied to the countries that will be most in, in need of it. And of course, there's no need to point out that in doing so, we're not entirely just expressing our international solidarity because what could be incubated now in this African and South Asian phase of the pandemic is a return of COVID in an even more frightening and lethal form. That happened, in, as I say, in, during the 1918s, like the second wave was far more deadly uh, than the first. To some degree, I fear we have had a kind of tropism toward America at first, toward a enclosed nationalist discourse on, on the left. We have to change that and we need to change it urgently. So that's my sermon for today, Basco. 
Well, uh, thank you, uh, Mike, Mike, for that. So just to, uh, for people who are tuning in um, later or halfway through this, um, uh, Mike Davis, of course, is the author of a bunch of different books, Planet of Sums, uh, City of Ports. He's a contributor to a um, host of different publications. Uh, and he recently had a piece of writing in, in Jackman. The very beginning of his talk, um, uh, Michael mentioned uh, that uh, Michael Sorkin um, you know, uh, news just came of this a few, um, a few minutes before we, we started, um, the architect and, and, an urbanist, um, uh, passed away, um, uh, after contracting, uh, coronavirus. Um, so, you know, our, obviously our, our, um, condolences and, and, you know, I think this, this just is just one of, of many, many examples we're going to have of how devastating this thing is, especially in a country with a inadequate um, public health, you know, infrastructure with inadequate planning and a, uh, you know, in many ways, even if you look at things from, from uh, how the US state is gonna respond, how relief is, is gonna be distributed, um, as, as Jacobin's uh, executive editor uh, said earlier today, um, you know, the US is looking more and more like a, uh, like a failed, failed state. So, we're going to take um, a few questions um, uh, now to uh, to start with. If you have any uh, questions for Mike, you know, please um, put them into your um, into the channel. And we're going to be doing these talks uh, with a host of different thinkers almost every day at six p.m. Uh, so you know, tune in. Um, you know, obviously, the access to all this stuff is is free. You know, support Jacobin down the road. We'll be around for for a while, but. Uh, but we just hope that that you know this is of of some um, of some use. Uh, tomorrow we're going to have Nicole Ashoff, our editor at large, um, who will be talking about the recent uh, Senate relief bill and comparing it to the 2008 uh, bailout and kind of dissecting um, the ways in which these bills uh, are really really um, geared towards uh, the interests of the tiny elite that runs this country. Obviously, there's aspects of it that are going to help ordinary workers, but um, you know, there's a host of other things in that bill that uh, Nicole is going to um, scrutinize. Um, so, for Mike, let me just scroll through some of these questions. Um, I guess the general theme of of these questions. Um, a few of them relate to um, the lack of global health um, infrastructure. So I, I guess maybe a concrete way to phrase that would be um, you alluded to getting beyond just a kind of left nationalist paradigm for our politics on the socialist left. Um, what would some of this um, look like concretely? What would be some of these uh, demands? How do we let's say organizing for those of us in the uh, global north, organizing in a place like the United States beyond just demanding Medicare for all and improvement to our own health infrastructure, what are kind of some of the internationalist demands we could make that would help the uh, global south? Some years ago, as part of this project uh, uh, on globalization that's formed the framework for a number of my books, uh, including the flu book, but I also wrote a book on the history of the car bomb. And I got an invitation to speak at the Naval War College. Most of my friends, uh, left-wing friends wanted me to go. I didn't, uh, I just couldn't cross that, that line. But the Admiral, who was the president of the War College, uh, asked if we could meet sometime in San Diego. So one day I went out to Coronado to the Navy base here and uh, spent an hour or two having a beer with him. And what he really wanted to talk about was the following, that only the United States Navy has the capacity to move the uh, infrastructure of a medium-sized city anywhere on Earth where there's a port or a seashore, including these two huge hospital ships, but also power plants, everything. And that proved enormously uh, effective during uh, the tsunamis uh, in Indonesia and, and uh, uh, the Indian Ocean. His question to me was, how many of these humanitarian disasters are going to be? And he said, look, he said, my boys and girls, you know, 
really like doing disaster relief. It's far better than bombing wedding parties in Afghanistan. But we can't get Congress to approve a humanitarian mission for uh, the Navy, except at times when we're available and it conforms to the American <clears throat> foreign policy. We have the, the means to double the size of such a uh, emergency fleet, whether under civilian management or keeping it still in the Navy, I don't care. Uh, this is something that we've done effectively in the past, albeit sometimes for selfish imperialist reasons, but it's a capacity to develop. As is the point I made earlier, that we must ramp up and keep ramped up the production of essential medical supplies to be supplied free in mass to the countries that need them. But above all, progressives must push for a global right to public health and universal coverage and support that in every, every way. I'm so sorry, my phone's going off here. No, that's that's the the beauty of live stuff, and we uh, you know we we briefly lost um, lost Mike to the to the telephone, but um, all right, um, Mike, uh, uh, how about for one more a uh, couple additional questions? Uh, one came in uh, from Joe Allen, uh, which is um, kind of more of a strategy oriented question. He asked, you know, the list logistics industry is obviously at the center of this. This crisis, um, obviously, it looks like more and more people, even those who who resisted it thus far, are now relying on Amazon supply chains to um, get basic goods. Um, and obviously, this is going to lead to a reorder, broader reordering of the economy. But I think the thrust of Joe Allen's uh, question is is about, um, I guess, uh, the thoughts for for the left organizing logistics and its kind of implications. Do you have any thoughts there? Yes, um, but let me begin with a, uh, um, a conceptual clarification. Let's consider the two kinds of demands that the left can make, Rooseveltian demands and Debsian demands. The Rooseveltian demand, which I, uh, is the subject of a piece I've coming out in the nation next week, would be an excess profits tax in the First World War and the Second World War. Corporations uh, with profiting hugely off of war production were subject to an excess profits tax capped in the Second World War at 7%. Now, this was also done during the, the Korean War. An attempt was made to revise it in the 19, late 1970s during the, the oil crisis. So you have three Democratic presidents, Wilson, FDR, and then Truman who've successfully used excise, excess profits tax, got it passed by Congress, and in all cases enjoyed huge popular support. Now, who is the biggest profiteer in this crisis? It's a no-brainer, it's Jeff Bezos. Amazon's uh, turnover is you know, soaring astronomically in its profits, but even more to the point, if this becomes an extinction event for tens and possibly hundreds of thousands of small businesses and franchises, uh, this gives Amazon, makes Amazon into possibly the biggest monopoly in, in world history. It will clear it out all the little competitors and, and uh, uh, particularly as we get used now to depending on Amazon to uh, you know, ship our essential things, food, and so on. So of course, the Rooseveltians response to this would be let's introduce an excess cap profits tax, tax the hell out of Bezos and direct large part of it to the postal service. A couple of weeks ago, two Democratic committee chairs in the House held a press conference and announced that the Postal Service could be bankrupt, could collapse this uh, uh, summer. 
That's ridiculous. It's on excess prof profits tax or something similar. The Debsian solution is, well, to recognize that at this point, antitrust laws aren't sufficient to deal with the kind of behemoth that um, Amazon's become. And we, we should regard its extraordinary logistics system uh, as part of the infrastructure of the digital age, uh, along with uh, broadband, along with the social media, et cetera. So the Debsian solution uh, is to advocate what the socialists advocated in 1910 vis-a-vis -vis private utilities, uh, telephone companies, power companies, water companies, all across the United States. Transform them into public utilities and administer them democratically uh, on a more decentralized basis, if need be. But we should be demanding that as socialists while we support liberals and other progressives who should be demanding an excess profits tax. That's my take. So not just our, our bread and butter social democratic demands, but actually thinking about um, ownership and, and control in these wider questions of, of political economy um, uh, today. So I'm um, going through these comments now. Um, actually, for a comment section, these are very positive and non-angry comments. Uh, no profanity either. Jonathan Bell says, I recommend City of Courts as a foundational reading to my urban planning uh, mentees in Los Angeles. No questions, just a huge thank you and keep writing. Um, I, 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 I imagine um, that's, that's the tone and tenor of this comment section, which, which maybe the internet is changing. Um, okay, so a few more questions. One is, um, how um, do you think, Mike, um, our political institutions and parties in particular uh, might be transformed by this crisis? So will one of the major parties still look the same at the end of this um, as this crisis? I mean, could this spur some sort of realignment in some way? You know, obviously this is just prognostication, but what do you, what do you think? Well, on one hand, I think we need to recognize that the Republican Party and the Republican Party long before Trump, but all the more so now, has become a threat to humanity on the same scale as the Nazis were in the 1930s and at the beginning of the Second World War. They've done more than anyone to prevent global action on climate change. And they have spent the last 40 years, ever since. Uh, the inauguration of Ronald Reagan, downsizing public health, ignoring warnings. And of course, a lot of neoliberal Democrats have gone along with this. I mean, I think one of the uh, uh, lowest moments was when after the defeat of Clinton's health care proposal, uh, the Democrats removed universal coverage from their platform, which by the way, brings me to the other point, which is right now, while we're dealing with all the local emergencies and trying to educate people as to why this has all happened and what it means, we must be gearing up for the Democratic Convention. Now in 2016, Trump turned over the Republican Platform Committee to the Christian right and said, put in anything you want, I'll support it uh, unconditionally. Often in conventions, platforms are just a little decoration, a kind of solve for the defeated party or, or, or candidates. It has to be different this time in Milwaukee. If Bernie concedes to Biden, that's not the end of the fight, must make Medicaid, Medicare for all, part of the platform. Free public edu higher education, part of the platform. In that sense, the battles just begin. And this will take place against the background 
of the most powerful imaginable argument for the urgency of universal coverage and reinvestment in public health uh, in this country. So I'm, I'm very hopeful, actually, that this, this fight uh, will occur. And I'm very hopeful that it can be won. So, Mike, I, I think there's a couple questions that, that follow a similar theme, which is that obviously some serious state action is needed to, uh, to enforce physical distancing to, you know, certain measures of, of, uh, that involve surveillance, that involve some sort of state activity. Um, how should we view these measures? How do we both advocate for common sense emergency uh, measures, but also um, be wary of kind of this becoming a norm of state authoritarianism, uh, especially if one of the lessons when everything um, is, is done, you know, in however long it takes um, in, in 2021, what if one of the lessons is, well, the uh, more aggressive aspects of the state response in Singapore or China um, is, is what worked and the US state was too soft and, and so on. So, so I guess this question of, of uh, measures needed to contain the emergency and the, the creeping of, of, of state um, authoritarianism and also the use of surveillance and other technology was one question that was, that was brought up. Well, of course, we all know since 9-11 that the war of terrorism on terrorism was used to create the, uh, the framework for authoritarian power in countries all over the world. Uh, that emergency, states of emergency are never really lifted, that anti-terrorist legislation deemed necessary at a particular time stays on the book forever. And the same thing's happening right now. I think the most egregious case is of course Israel where Netanyahu is used for the pandemic to attempt to silence the majority, get himself off the hook because he's facing uh, uh, a felony trial. And many Israelis, uh, uh, liberal left-wing Israelis, talk about this as a silent coup, literally uh, a coup. We'll see far more examples of that. How do you fight these power grabs? Well, well two things. First is we should never ever yield the street, yield public space to government. Uh, my daughter showed me today a uh, thing on her cell phone of the San Diego police chasing some poor surfer in a totally deserted beach to enforce uh, Governor Newsom's regulations about uh, stay at home. Well, it was keystone tops, it was ridiculous. But on the other hand, uh, the state hasn't had much time to think through this or fine tune social dis distancing. So put up with stuff like that. But we should not pull down our banners and be afraid to step outside and protest. Social distancing, yes, but not at the price of, of protest. There's no reason that uh, a single line of 10 people holding picket signs standing three meters apart uh, is endangering anybody's lives. But the struggle just begins. And in a piece that's now up the nation website called uh, lessons from Wuhan, I try and make the point that what was effective in China, okay, was not because a million Uyghurs were being held in camps or because the state is surveilling jaywalkers everywhere and, and uh, evaluating their social credit. No, it's because China has an outstanding medical establishment it had the kind of stockpiles of essential supplies we don't. And most importantly, for better or worse, it has the party committee at every level, right down to the apartment building you live in. There's an organized group of your fellow citizens able to act in a coordinated and decisive way. And when that is a justified use of power, then the Chinese people have gone along with it. They've shown 
really admirable discipline. So in the beginning, it was a disaster in China with the lack of democracy and the old traditional characteristics of Chinese bureaucracy, suppressed information, allowed it to, uh, to spread. But this was followed by decisive action implemented by millions of party members. And China has suppressed the outbreak. It may return again as people come back from China, from places like Italy or the United States, but it's shown an extraordinary capacity to do that. So it's very important we don't learn the wrong lessons and that we begin thinking about how a democratic and participatory democratic uh, uh, pandemic plan would work. One that mobilizes popular courage and gives social roles uh, to all of us, backed up by universal health care and the kind of stockpiles of essential things we need manufactured by the government. All right. So on this related question, what do we do in the U.S. given that our uh, capacity seems so much weaker than those of our opponents? So where in particular, one question is, uh, do you see the key levers for, for socialists and progressives writ large uh, to press for social change now? Obviously, a lot of our typical kind of things in our, our toolkit, uh, you know, rally street protests aren't viable um, now. So I guess you you just mentioned uh, one thing we could do, which is, you know, still do street protests, just do them, you know, with some physical distancing, uh, still do disruptive um, action, not seed uh, the the seat, the street to just, you know, state authorities and, and the right. But uh, I mean, is there anything else? Of course. Uh, the first step, I believe, is to take leadership from unionized uh, frontline medical workers. I mean, I believe that right now nurses are the social conscience of this country. Uh, and nurses, of course, have been the backbone of the Sanders campaign. We have to broaden the definition of who's a frontline medical workers because it also includes nursing home staff, janitors, people who pick up garbage, includes the Amazon warehouse workers without uh, uh, protection. These people are not only our heroes right now, and we should broadcast in every way our solidarity, but as Marxists, we should be socialists, we should recognize uh, their historical agency. They've become an immensely powerful progressive force, working class force uh, for change. So whether or not you work with inside the uh, parameters of the Sanders campaign or based on your own local uh, collective through the Democratic Socialist America, whatever, begin with solidarity with health workers, find out what the nurses union and progressive doctors are saying, look out for the people who are in the front line of this, but ignored by everybody else. I mean, there's two places where the greatest toll mortality is, at least percentage-wise, uh, almost inevitable in nursing homes and jails and prisons. Of course, refugee camps and INS detention centers. Jim Straub, who's an old friend of mine I've known since the days when he was writing the splits and binds to organize for the SEIU, is a union rep for nursing homes in the Seattle area. And weeks ago, was telling me that because public health officials ignored the nursing home staff in the same way that so many of us, well, we'll pay attention to the maitre d' and maybe to the waitress, but we ignored the bus boy, the guy, the person who's working, you know, washing the dishes, they ignored the, uh, the workers in these nurse homes, they ignored the fact that they make so little, these are minimum wage jobs, a large percentage of them moonlight. They have second jobs nearby, uh, uh, other nearby uh, nursing homes. And by this uh, process, uh, the infection, which has killed uh, more than 35 people now in this original nursing home, spread to 10 other nursing homes. And that's 
of course, going on around the country. It's to people like the nursing home staff and the other millions of people who provide essential uh, services and can't stop working. Uh, postal car uh, letter carriers, for instance, postal workers in general, warehouse, et cetera. Here is the basis without necessarily having to go on the streets at this particular moment uh, that we can begin uh, to organize on. Uh, the forces for profound change in medical provision are going stronger day by day, but depend on us on the left to have their backs and produce the kind of active uh, solidarity that's so urgent right now. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mike, for your your time. There's, there's a few great um, questions left, but I think that's a good place to to um, to end it. And just to you know remind everyone uh, tuning in that we're going to be doing these uh, talks, this video lecture series, uh, almost every day at 6 p.m. Uh, Eastern. Uh, maybe one or two will do it noon on the weekend, just because we want some uh, some guests and and. Other, other time zones. Uh, we don't want people waking up at, at 3 a.m. Um, in, in India, for instance. Um, we um, uh, will be doing these. Uh, we hope you can tune in. And um, you know, again, obviously, if you're, if you're on this YouTube page, you probably have heard of Jackman Magazine. If not, it's the name of the YouTube channel, and you should uh, read the writing of Mike and a host of other great, um, great contributors there. Uh, tomorrow at 6 p.m. we'll have Nicole Ashoff, and she'll be talking about this uh, recent uh, Senate bill, uh, the prospects for it, uh, what's in it that will help uh, workers, but what's in it that's essentially just uh, a corporate bailout with very little guarantees that this will, you know, be be put to to um, good use. Um, so anyway, once again, uh, thanks a lot to to Mike, and thank you all for for tuning in for your questions. Thank you.